Well, Merry Christmas. Wow, I cannot believe it is the 18th. It is the 18th already. That means next Sunday is Christmas, right? Next Sunday is the 25th. I hope that you plan on rejoining us this Saturday uh, for our Christmas Eve services. We'll have two, uh, they'll be completely identical. We'll have one at 5 p.m. and one at 7 p.m. Please pick the one that works best for your family. Get here early, get here early. Uh, we always run out of seats, so if you want to get a, a seat for you and your kids or, or your family, uh, please show up uh, early. We're, we're continuing right now to look at our theme uh, for the holidays, which was joy to the world, right? Christmas is something new. We said it's a day of worship. It's the beginning of a, a little a little bit of rebellion, and it was certainly a celebration of giving. And when Isaac Watts wrote the song, Joy to the World, he tried to capture some of the feeling of that day. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. So that is what we are doing right now. This one week left before Christmas, we are preparing him room. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. He is. He is coming. And that's what Advent means. We have these weeks of Advent. Advent means arrival. And if you knew that it was going to happen this Christmas, that the arrival would come this Christmas, I bet that you would celebrate Christmas differently. That you wouldn't just do the same things you would, you've always done. You would find new ways to prepare him room. And so we come to the end of Advent, and our goal through this whole month has been to encourage and to empower you to have a different Christmas, and maybe the Christmas that you've always wanted. And, and we're allowing God to uh, infuse Christmas with some authenticity and to make it possible for us to get through Christmas without a huge sigh of relief or disappointment or exhaustion or that we're just so glad that it's over. Christmas should be a time of joy. But not just for uh, the season, right? For the Christian, our, our lives should be a celebration of joy. And so we've looked at worship, we've looked at rebellion, we've looked at giving, and today we have one last thing to consider and we are gonna look at receiving. And for that, we're gonna turn back to the story of the shepherds. In Luke 2, it says, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So shepherds are outside tending sheep. And in the very next sentence that we read, angels, right? And you and I, we read these Bible stories and we come across a scene and there's angels and we think, yeah, no big deal. It's, it's the Bible. People, people see angels all the time. Uh, I'm sure the Bible is probably like 40% angels. No, no, no way. In fact, up until this moment in human history, nobody had seen or heard from an angel in hundreds of years. God has been silent. So this is not uh, a typical day. This is, not a, this is not a typical silent night. My typical night would be uh, come home from work, play with the boys for a little bit, catch up on some computer stuff, maybe call a family member, uh, have dinner, put my kids to bed, watch TV, read a little bit, go to bed. Next day, 
starts all over again, right? It's routine. Everything's the same. What the shepherds saw that night was not routine for anybody. Nobody expects a skyline filled with angels. And the Bible says these shepherds were afraid. Yeah, they were. Last week, uh, I went to go get the mail, and I pulled the, the cover down from my mailbox, and two lizards jumped out. And I, I screamed. I, that's not what I was expecting. Okay, so what do you think would happen if a night sky filled up with a flash mob from heaven? I, you, you think you wouldn't let out just a tiny little squeak? Angels are like the secret service. It's not who they are, it's who they represent. If you see the Secret Service, you know the president is close. If you see the paparazzi firing off cameras, then you know a celebrity is nearby. And if you see angels, what's close? Not baseball, God, right? Of course, God. It's not a routine thing for God to show up. That's not the norm. My uh, favorite Christmas song is Adolphe Adams' Oh Holy Night. And my favorite part is probably the same part uh, of the song that you like too. And neither of us can sing that part. It's the fall on your knees line, right? That line is not about babies or sheep. It's not about a little drummer boy. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. Oh, night, oh, holy night, oh, night divine. This is a holy night. This is a sacred moment that we are stepping into. God's plan for the world is coming together. God is here with us. The God who walked in the garden, the God who wrestled Jacob, the God who appeared as a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. The, the voice in the sky is coming to earth. He is on his way and he's going to be so small that you'll be able to hold him in your arms. O oh, night divine. What does a night like that look like? What does a night like that sound like? What does praise of angels sound like? Nobody had ever seen or heard that before except God. If I hear my wife sing a song in church, it makes me tear up. Can you imagine what your emotions would do to you to hear a heavenly choir? You see, the bottom line is Whatever view of Christmas is for you, whatever you picture in your mind when you picture Christmas or the Nativity, he's greater than that. Whatever you can picture, he's greater than that. He's more than that. Angels sang at his birth. That is not normal. The world will never see that again. Paul writes in Galatians, when the fulfillment of the time came, God sent his son. Tell me, how often do you think the fulfillment of time comes in a lifetime? How often? I mean, that is the Greek word pleroma, and it's the same word that sailors use when the very last box of cargo is put on the boat. When the very last passenger walks on board the ship, that ship is now full and it is now set to sail. The time has come. The scriptures say the world was ready, ready to move, ready to go. And in that moment, God came. God came to earth and the angels spilled across the night sky and they announced his birth. And the reality is, next Sunday will be a wonderful day, filled with laughter and joy. And then on Monday, life will go back to normal. It goes back to routine. But should it? That's not how the Christmas story ends. The angels proclaim there is an invitation. It was an invitation for the shepherds to uh, allow all these historical events in Bethlehem to become part of their personal stories. And it should have been easy for the activities in the stable to have moved on, and the shepherds would have been oblivious to all of it, but the angels prevented that. Look at verses 10, and 12, 10 through 12, a little closer. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy 
that will be for all the people. Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. The, the angels made this birth personal, right? They made the Jesus story their story. And if you want to have this Christmas that you've always longed for, we have to allow God to make this historical event our story too. We have to have some ownership in the Christmas story. This is, this is joy to the world. The shepherds experience this. We can experience it. But not the plastic, one day a year joy. A- authentic joy, Christian joy. And joy is such an interesting word to study. It has the same root as other words that we talk about in church. For instance, the word for joy or cheer is the word kara. And to be joyful is kairo. Now, you might think that word sounds familiar. It is familiar because that's the same root as charis, which is where we get the word grace, which means joy and grace are related. John 1.16 says, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. So for the way this story of joy becomes our story, we have to receive it. Tell me something, what do you think is more difficult? To give or to receive? Think about your answer, all right? Before you just say, what do you think is more difficult? I think it's more difficult to receive. For many of us, it's harder to receive than it is to give. We tend to shy away from receiving for many reasons. Uh, If someone pays us a compliment, then we become self-effacing. It's like, no, 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 right? When someone tries to help us with something or they want to, um, you know, come alongside us and give us a hand, we say, oh, that's okay. I don't need your help. No, I'm fine, right? Because in our head, we think that they're trying to offer us some sort of charity or that we can't do it. When someone offers us a gift, then it becomes awkward for us to receive it. It always feels good to give, right? You enjoy giving. It feels good, you know that. But there is something powerful also in the act of receiving because it brings the offer of a gift full circle and it brings fulfillment to both people. It kindles relationship. It honors the gift as valuable. Sometimes it's awkward to receive a gift. I know, okay? But the proper response is just two little words. Thank you. As kids, we loved getting gifts under the tree, right? The more the merrier. And you had lots of relatives. You had grandparents. You had two sets of grandparents. You had aunts. You had uncles. You had teachers. But now, you have a hard time receiving gifts because the closer you got to adulthood, the more awkward it became for you to receive something free with no strings attached, a gift. And the Bible agrees. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never never enter it. God's salvation is a gift, isn't it? Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Four times in Romans, Paul calls Jesus Christ and his salvation a gift from God. In chapter 5, he says, For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Chapter 6, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We also have a hard time accepting this perfect gift of grace, don't we? We think we don't. We think we don't, but we do. 
Because in our minds, we think it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. And, and there's no way that I can reciprocate it. Right? I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. It's way too extravagant. So, I try to work for it. I try to earn it. But why? I work harder. I buckle down. I say, next time I'll, I'll try even harder, God. I'm sorry, next time I'll do it even better. And we beat ourselves up when we fall short because we have a hard time receiving. That's why it's our stumbling block. And it, it is for a lot of people. All we can do, the Bible says, is open our hands and receive it. What does Jesus say? Like a child. Like a child. We can be thankful. Like a child, filled with joy. Filled with gratitude, like a child. This Christmas, I want you to pause, okay? I want you to really stop and make a list. Check it twice. Make a list of God's gifts to you. Did he give you family? Did he give you kids? In-laws? Grandchildren? A house with a roof? Cars that run? Can you pay your bills? Do you have food in the fridge? Do you have employment? Do you have clean water to drink? Allow that list to create joy within you. Give yourself permission to respond to God like a little child. Albert Einstein once said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle, and the other is as if everything is a miracle. Little children know that Christmas morning is a miracle. That's why they can't fall asleep. They still believe in magic. They still believe in wonder. That first Christmas, the shepherds saw some of that first Christmas magic. Angels in the sky, glory, radiance. The story ends with, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. The shepherds had the story of heaven become part of their story, and then they wanted to tell that story to others. They wanted other people to share that joy. That phrase there, made known, it means made known in such a way that people can understand, right? Made it relevant, made it applicable. In other words, they went and they witnessed and went as witnesses to others. They didn't hang around at the manger because, you know, let's, let's hang out here where the story is. Let's hang out here where it's cool. The angels were messengers to them. The angels told them what was going on. And so the shepherds said, now it's our turn. We get to be messengers. We get to tell others. Has it been a while since Christmas was a story that you could tell, where you became the messenger, where you, like the shepherds, got to tell people what Jesus has done in your life. Our first Christmas week, we read about Simeon at the temple, and he picked up the baby Jesus and he proclaimed, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. To see Jesus. To see God's salvation. When Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms, he receives God's precious gift. Christmas is all about God giving the greatest gift ever. But a gift demands a response. And there are only two responses when a gift is given. How will you respond to 
God's gift. One of the things that makes a gift special is the realization that the person who gave the gift spent some time thinking about you. It involves thought and action and cost, right? There's cost involved. There's something about Christmas that demands a response, isn't there? Have you ever heard the story of the Christmas truce in 1914? It was a cold Christmas Eve night. German soldiers were hunkered down in their muddy trench while British and French soldiers were hiding in their own underground trench. And between them, in what was known as no man's land, hundreds of dead bodies littered the frozen landscape. World War I had begun only months before and the fighting on the Western Front was very fierce. Hope for a quick war had evaporated and both armies knew they would be bitter enemies for years. But something happened on Christmas Eve. German soldiers began singing Silent Night in German. And soldiers on the other side of the Great Divide joined along in English. Soldiers who had been killing one another were now singing together about the wonder of Christ's birth. And as the singing continued, the soldiers emerged out of their trenches to join one another in the no man's land. And they exchanged gifts. And they helped bury the dead and they even played soccer together. An estimated 100,000 soldiers experienced a spontaneous silent night that year. The truce continued throughout Christmas Day, even if for one brief moment there was peace on earth and goodwill to men. One of the greatest beauties of the gospel is the way that it welcomes all, everyone. And there's no, there's no race, there's no nationality, there's no social status, there's no political background, right? Christmas comes to everyone. Is there anyone that you need to be at peace with this Christmas? Are you in a trench with a friend? Are you at war with a family member? I would ask you to consider stepping out this Christmas and walking across those lines with a hand of grace, with a hand of friendship, with a hand of forgiveness. There's an even greater war going on right now and it's the war that's taking place in hearts and minds. The Bible says that we are enemies of God and that our sins have created a great divide between him and us. But the joy of Christmas is that God sends the Prince of Peace. He's the bridge and he allows entrenched enemies to just have not a short-lived truce, but to have peace with God forever. Imagine that this present was under the tree and it was wrapped up and it had your name on it. Someone who loves you, someone who knows exactly what you need, wrapped up this gift of grace just for you. So here's the question. What do you do to make that present yours? Do you try to earn it? Do you reject it? Or Will you just receive it? You see, until you receive it and open it, it's not really yours, isn't it? You have to take it. You have to receive it. God is giving you a gift right now. God wants to give you something today. And it's something bigger than just a nice Christmas. He wants to give you his son. He wants to set you free from the net the snare, and he wants to set you free. Not, not free from today, not even free from tomorrow, but free forever. This is the gift, and we call it the gospel. This is the good news. This is what every single person here today is thankful for. You're, we are thankful, and we want you to know how to continue in this faith, to cling to hope, 
And here's the best part. It's simple. It's as simple as ABC. A, you just admit that you're not perfect. Admit that you're a sinner. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect. Heaven's not filled with perfect people. And heaven is not a reward for a perfect life. If it were, nobody would go. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you become a Christian, you're still not perfect. But right now, a church is waiting for you and they are a group of people who will surround you and they will love you and they are made up of imperfect people as well and they will embrace you to become part of a family. And that family together believes in Jesus. That's B. Believe in Jesus. If you believe that God came as that little baby in a manger, if you believe that God came and was wrapped in swaddling clothes, if you believe that that baby stood there in the manger for the whole world to see, shepherds, wise men, Mary, Joseph, a night sky filled with angels, and that man grew up and he preached a message of grace and love and hope and forgiveness, he stands ready to offer you a new life. Jesus says of himself that he is the key. Acts says there is no salvation by anyone else and there is no other name under heaven given among people by which they can be saved. And if you could admit that you're a sinner and you can believe in Jesus, then the only thing you have to do is confess it. And that's C. Just confess it. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief and admission, those are the cornerstones of salvation. And if that sounds like the perfect Christmas gift, then I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I want to repent and live the way that you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me. And thank you for choosing me to be part of your family. Well, I gotta say it again. I gotta say Merry Christmas because Christmas is next Sunday. I wanna remind you, I wanna remind you, Saturday is Christmas Eve. We have two services, five o'clock, seven o'clock. And then the next Sunday on Christmas Day, our church doors are closed. It's like the, it's the only day, uh, only Sunday we've been closed, but we want you to stay home and we want you to be with your family. We want you to make memories with them. If you, if you, got, if you had that need to come to church, come on Saturday, come to our, uh, our Christmas Eve services. That's what we've prepared for you. It's gonna be a great night. We're gonna tell the Christmas story. We're gonna have Advent candles. We'll have a children's moment. Uh, it'll, it'll be a candlelight service. We, we're so excited to spend this Christmas Eve with you. Please have a blessed and safe holiday. Merry Christmas. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.